I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like Live right here on Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. So go ahead and reach out and tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend, like the good ear doctor says, and jump on in. Come on in. Get this boom bap breakfast as I hold it down for the remix morning show, which will be back in full effect tomorrow, Tuesday morning on Black Power Mondays. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, uh, in the meantime, yeah, come on in, uh, definitely, uh, again, this is another good one from Math Hoffa, uh, and it would be better if he was part of the crew or, you know, uh, since I reference him so much, get in here, get in here, but another one, wipe your feet, you know what I mean? Hit the like button. Don't just come in, take your shoes off. And then show some respect to the house. Click the like button, the join button. Click that bell so you're notified when all these good things that keep happening on this channel come up and you don't miss them. Whether it's Sundays, Ear Doctor Spinning, uh, Uncle Devin in the mo uh, uh, Saturday morning kids show, Warrior Class Saturday afternoons. Uh, I mean, Riot Starter with Kalanji been popping up all over the place with 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 Daruba the other day and Patrice Lumumba's daughter, uh, uh, the next. Uh, a lot of stuff on the channel that you, you don't want to miss. Uh, you know, new shows coming on board very soon. The Sisters from Brokish be joining. Big announcement coming. Uh, within our gates film discussion from uh, the good NYU professor of film Mtume Gant and Adam Johnson a lot of other stuff coming too there's just more there's just, there's just a lot so definitely uh, join on up and uh, uh, yeah Greetings, greetings, greetings. Uh, nothing happened to Dr. CBS. She and Dr. Layla Brown are just uh, going to relaunch Peace Ricky, the last dope intellectual on uh, their own platform. We wish them well. Morning, morning, morning. Peace, peace, peace. Let's go. That's what I'm talking about. And before we get, we have a lot of guests coming today, uh, or a few guests coming today. Uh, uh, some of my favorite guests coming today. Um, making moves, making moves, no doubt. Morning, morning, morning. Uh, and some of those uh, uh, moves are are... Uh, and same thing, Dr. Ichile, well, not same thing. Well, maybe same thing. Dr. Ichile is just taking a hiatus. So I'm not sure, you know, wish her well, see if she comes back. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we will continue to do what we can. By the way, um, oh, speaking of the medicine bag, though. Go check out, it's not a drug, it's medicine in our interview with the Ancestor Project from the other day. And your boy took the next step. So, you know, I'm going to, as I go through this journey with the Ancestor Project, which I am, uh, steps have been taken. 
want to invite you all to not, and I'll put the link uh, when uh, 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 to that episode in this one, but definitely want to encourage you all to check that out because uh, as much as can as it can be or is as appropriate, uh, I will be sharing uh, at least some of my own engagement. Uh, with that process and uh, we'll be having them back on to talk about that. So I had uh, my next stage in, you know, initial intake meeting the other day and that went very well. Uh, So, you know, your boy, you know, we're not only, we don't just talk about it. We are about it over here and we, we heal, we want to heal. We want to have a revolution and we want to win. So uh, definitely. Yeah. Uh, um, mm Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed, Sugar Booger, and good morning. Yeah, what is the Ancestor Project? Please go check that interview uh, uh, titled It's uh, Medicine, Not a Drug, uh, in addition of I Mix What I Like Live. And um, uh, yeah, and and get caught up. But it's, uh, let's see, where was that thing? Yeah. Let's see if I could just pull it up right here. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I'm, I'll definitely put the link to that to that episode in this one, as I said, and encourage people to, to review that um, uh, that clip when it went up. Let's see what what did happen to it, though. Uh, I would like to pull it up real quick while we're here. But um, it was a very, very powerful discussion. and. Um, Definitely want to encourage people to check it out. Anyway, I'll just, like I said, I will put the link, but uh, it's right here. It's medicine, not a drug. Um, I clipped it from the full show. It's what I like, what I like, what uh, I like. With, again, the Ancestor Project, Charlotte jo- Charlotte James, rather, Andrea, Andre Wright, Andrea Wright, were our guests. And it was uh, a pretty dope, pun intended, conversation with Brother Kaaba uh, as well. Uh, so definitely check that out. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yeah, appreciate that a little bit, a little bit. Anyway, so, okay, we do have a lot to get to. So, like I said, please, you know, it's great to see everybody. Thank you all for joining us. uh, And uh, please invite others to do the same. In the nine o'clock hour, we're going to be joined again by Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs. He's got a couple new book reviews and uh, he is... (laughs) He has reviewed uh, the new books, uh, Say Their Names, How Black Lives Matter Came to America, uh, and The Matter of Black Lives, uh, edited by Jelani Cobb for The New Yorker. And uh, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss the discussion. His review is at imixwhatilike.org, but um, you don't want to miss the discussion. Uh, And hopefully our first guest, will be in part of that discussion as well. We'll stick around all day because our, our first guest who I'm going to bring here up in just a second is somebody who, if you've ever listened to my old radio show uh, or watched any of the work I've done, uh, you've heard his name. If you are familiar with uh, DC politics, you will know who this man is. If you were really involved in the civil rights struggle at one point in black liberation struggle once upon a time you will know this man's name and probably have engaged him at some point but as he likes to say a line i've quoted from him many many times <laughs> if everybody who once said if everybody who says that they were on the edmund pettus bridge was actually there would have collapsed <laughs> Um, which actually features well with our, our second discussion because one of those uh, 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 type of veterans is is involved with with uh, those book reviews. Uh, uh, that is people who, again, you know, uh, certainly if you have uh, engaged the jazz community or uh, Black American classical music, as he's known, 
to have called it. If you have listened to WPFW 89.3 in Washington, D.C., and been fortunate enough to catch his shows, uh, his time when he he would pass through my show, uh, uh, going back when with his many decades, you are you are super fortunate as well. Uh, and as we're going to talk a little bit about, if you went through the graduate program in Yellow Springs, Ohio, at, at, at Antioch College, uh, as did my father, uh, who at one point was a close friend of, this, of our next guest, you would also know who this next man is. And of course, I'm talking about the man himself, my godfather, Mr. Tom Porter, uh, and we welcome him back to the program once again. Good morning, good sir. Uh, not sure what happened. I think you just froze as I was bringing you up. I don't know. Can we, can you, do you hear me? Are you at least there? No, I think we lost him. Oh man. Oh, his video in the background, I think is frozen. And that's why, uh, anyway, so, but, but anyway, I get, we'll bring Mr. Porter up when he's, when he's ready to go. Uh, one of the funniest, most brilliant uh, people I've ever ha had the, the pleasure to meet, as I'm sure is the case for, for most. Uh, and when he's all set, uh, we'll just bring him back. Um, anyway, so let me, but in the meantime, there are a number of things that I did want to get to uh while uh Brother Porter gets, uh, and then his daughter was set to join us as well. Uh, and I'll let him tell us talk about that when we get him back because that was actually uh anyway, i'll let him deal with that so check this out there are a number of things that i would like to bring to 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 the bpm uh to the remixers here uh this morning and i want to start with uh something that has come up in <laughs> that has come up in what I know is something you all love to have and hear me talk about. Uh, is the wonderful world, and I do mean world, of, oh man, this is just, where is the picture that was associated with the link, which is why I clicked it. Oh man, buddy, buddy, buddy. Uh, okay, so I will right, we'll just do it this way. Um, Uh, try to get Mr. Porter back. Okay, so check this out. So uh, this past weekend, a remarkable weekend, and, and I know you know no 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 other host on BPM or maybe anywhere is going to give it to you this way or give this to you at all. But it was an incredible world, an incredible weekend in international world football, or what this country calls soccer. And a lot happened. You had El Clasico, Real Madrid versus Barcelona. You had uh, the game, and which is really where I'm going, maybe the game of the week in the Premier League where you had the legendary Manchester United get crushed 5 nothing by Liverpool, uh, my youngest daughter's favorite team. Uh, and Liverpool looked, as they say, magisterial in destroying Manchester United featuring Ronaldo, who had a great goal called back for offsides, but not the original El Fenomeno, but Cristiano Ronaldo, because El Fenomeno is, of course, retired. But I like to point out that the original Ronaldo, Brazilian Ronaldo, may be the GOAT. He's up there with Pele. Some say in his ultimate prime, he had even surpassed. And if you check the highlights of that ultimate prime years, it was just a couple of them because he got hurt. But whoo, size, speed, handles, as they would say in basketball. But check this out. So the thing was that, that Mohamed Salah, the Egyptian magician, Liverpool's talisman, uh, put up a hat trick, scored three goals, okay? 
And this is actually something that is, I think, relevant to our Pan-African, African world BPM conversation because Muhammad Salah, in scoring his hat trick, became, as they say, the top African goal scorer in the English Premier League history. The English Premier League, for those not familiar, is often considered to be the best league in the world because it has all the money. It now has a whole bunch of uh, Middle Eastern money. As as Buster Rhymes once said, they got that Arab money. <laughs> but a lot of Middle Eastern investment, a lot of global investment in the English Premier League. It's the richest league. It has the most money spent on players, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, this, this, you know, uh, so they're able to, to buy and pay for the best players. So, but when they announced this, I thought it was fascinating and it reminds of so many interesting discussions because I have to admit being a fan of the African world, I used to like that until Salah broke the record, the, the top scorer in the African world in the English premier league was Didier Drogba, who was a fan favorite, a great player, and a former teammate of Mohamed Salah, pictured here uh, on, uh, I guess that's our right, next to Didier Drogba. And I raise this because I think it's fascinating. Similar, somewhat relevant, and very, actually, not similar, very relevant to the, cl this, the class discussion we just had in my intro to Black Studies this past week. Uh, around identity, the African continent, history, the relationship of, uh, and in the context of Dr. John Henry Clark specifically, the relationship of Arabs, Islam, and Africa. Even in the context, as it was brought up recently with Ali Mazrui, the late great history, uh, it was brought up, he was mentioned on the remix. I had a chance to take a, a class with him back in the day at the Africana Studies Research Center under James Turner. Uh, uh, at Cornell University, uh, very humble guy. I don't know that I agreed with him on everything, but he was kind enough to allow left-leaning discussion and debate in his class. His teaching assistant, not so much, not so much. He, he was a hater, but, you know, he was the assistant. <laughs> anyway, Professor Mazrui, uh, on the other hand, was was very gracious with, with, with all of that uh, 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 and even polite and and tame, so to speak, in his total condemnation of Henry Louis Gates' uh, wonders of the African world. Okay. But because Majui had that whole, the triple heritage of Africa, Islam, Christianity, or Islam, the West, and African, you know, traditions, uh, he came up on the remix. And then this, this was part of the discussion that John Henry Clark used to have uh, a, a a strong position on, very hostile to Arabs and to Islam. He was very open about that. So we were bringing this up. We had this conversation. So, so when they said, when they announced, as they did, that Muhammad Salah, who is amazing, dude is amazing, the Egyptian magician. And I like how, I do like that often when he scores a goal, he goes into uh, almost he he does the he often will do the the uh, traditional Islamic prayer, uh, even bowing all the way down, uh, facing east. And I love that this whole majority white British audience, at least live, but the whole world watches, has you know has to sit back and take that. And I know not all of them love that, but they you know but they want those goals though. Uh, and he, he's been bringing them in bunches and this year he's been killing it. So when he was given, when they said they announced that he is the leading African goal scorer, I thought of, I mean, it was perfectly timed. We're going to bring it up in my class tomorrow morning. They, they, and ask him about that. So, and I'll just leave it there. <laughs> You know, the whole thing about is, I mean, having been to Egypt a couple of times, you see the tension, or at least I felt like you could see the tension between what they want to be uh, uh, and, uh, you know, a very Arabicized Islamic community, you know, society, also a very modern one. But then also they have to deal with and make a whole bunch of money from 
what Africans, black now often described as sub-Saharan Africans had to, you know, produced. So anyway, it's this, this and, and I remember a shout out to Ayeli Bikari at the Africana Studies Research Center, uh, who, who used to talk about that, this, this tension in, in our classes, this tension of you want, a, you want an Islamic community that doesn't pay tribute to other religious traditions, but you have to make all this money from ancient Kemet. <laughs> so anyway, I just thought that was interesting. I was just interesting. Uh, anyway, I'm very happy because my daughter was happy that Liverpool won. Uh, Muhammad Salah is very good. But I have to admit, I I, I liked that Drogba was, was that guy that had that record. Uh, but I'd have, you know, you know, anyway. So, uh, 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 anyway, I just thought that was interesting. And what does that mean? Um, anyway, oh, I thought he was back. We could try again in just a minute. So definitely let me know what you think. I, I, I do, I, you know, I'm not in the chat now, but I will get into the comments later. Uh, so definitely leave a comment or, 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 you know, uh, put, you know, if you're in the chat now, put your comments in there and I'll check them out later on. Uh, you know, and, 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 but, uh, I am very interested in that. And I thought that was fascinating and the timing couldn't have been better because just last week in my classes, we had this discussion. I know it comes up all the time. Even when I was in the Malcolm X grassroots movement, I remember, uh, a sister, an Egyptian, an Arab Egyptian sister talked about joining the organization. And she asked, would I be allowed to do, do, do Egyptians and Arabs from Egypt who recognize themselves as the part of the, the African world get to join. And of course the answer was yes, but, but I just, I, it, it was just, it's just, you know, the whole thing, uh, got to meet him once too at the African studies and research center, uh, Kwame Nkrumah's, uh, uh, son, uh, the, 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 the product of, so to speak of his father's relationship with an Arab Egyptian woman. And I know about all the tensions and hostilities that that's caused. I understand some of the politics, or at least some of what has been said about the politics and the pan-African attempt, attempted pan-African unity of, of, of uniting uh, uh, the, the Nkrumah and Nasser communities, but, you know, but uh, families and, hit, and, and communities. But um, I, I just, I, anyway. I just know anyway, it was just, it's any clearly in my class, it was an ongoing, I mean, this is an ongoing tense, not uh, all agreed upon issue. So, uh, um, and then at the same time, even as it is, it has to be done in other contexts, there has to be recognition that even, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's an issue of complexion within the black community or something else, it has to be recognized when, uh, how, certain segments of the community are offered invitations to others and how certain segments of the community benefit uh, from certain invitations from other communities. So anyway, that was, that was just one thing. I thought that was fascinating. Um, and I, I, again, I could not, it could not have been better timed. Um, Another thing that I wanted, that, so I had actually forgotten that I had given this interview uh, a couple of weeks ago, but the the story just came out, uh, and admittedly hadn't fully prepared to go through this this morning, but since we have a couple of minutes, uh, I did want to get to it a little bit, um, uh, and I'll put the link, of course, in the, in the show notes to this episode. But this new story, uh, sneaker retailers are a white boys club built on black creativity and capital. And I had totally forgotten about this interview. I had a, a fascinating discussion with 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 uh, Curtis, the author, uh, about he, he wanted sort of my opinion on uh, the uh, relationship of uh hip hop 
and black people broadly speaking to the to sneaker culture popularity and to pop culture admittedly i'm not a, a, a sneaker you know aficionado i'm not i although i'm obviously aware of the, the culture but i'm not that deeply in it so my comments were were, were more about the issue of consumption uh and uh black relationship to popular culture in this country but uh it, it was interesting because the uh author quotes me um i think accurately and more extensively than i would have thought and, and that i that i uh, am sometimes accustomed to but they do in this what often ends up happening with the buying power argument. Um, the short of it is there is a great degree of difficulty in breaking entirely cognitively from the intellectual bindings to capitalism and consumption and the claims that there is some sort of power in consumption. Um, I should have done this, you know, I forgot his name. The, uh, um, I think he's a white guy. I can't remember. But um, there, there's a, a book of some uh, some degree of popularity uh, about buying power. And I should have I should have I just didn't have the space with, with my publishing agree, agreement with 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 uh, Paul Grave initially. I didn't have the space to do it, but I should have and maybe should do it separately and just publish it separately. Uh, a sort of lit review of of how people write about uh, boycotts and consumer buy power or buying power, because there is this this not only the mythology I do talk about in in my own work, but there's this associated and more uh, it's almost like a cottage industry of writing about uh, the Montgomery boycott and other and and the the potential of boycotts and consumer power to overthrow power. There's an overblown emphasis and reference to these attempts uh, that I think, particularly today, with 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 the fluidity of capital, the internationalization of capital, the 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 extension of previously you know already set in motion uh, uh, neo-colonial relationships, and uh, it, it boycotting would really take the international unity uh, of workers that Marx was talking about a hundred some years ago for to, to, to work. The idea that black people in small pockets here in the United States could boycott anything and have it relate to some, you know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's bananas. Uh, hey, shout out to uh, JT coin rings. Appreciate that. And I'm glad you joined Dr. Maad's book club and I'm glad she used the work. And apparently, um, uh, uh, apparently appreciates the work. And I, I think they're making good use of it. And honestly, I, I, I almost don't even care what the conclusions are of those who read it. I just deeply appreciate people reading it and to the extent possible, engaging it in discussion and in their work. So shout out to Dr. Maat. I appreciate her for doing that. And to JT Coin Rings for, for joining her and getting the book and dropping us a, a super chat here as well. I appreciate that. Um, and I, I definitely, I, you know, even if we don't agree, I really appreciate that they, that anybody would take the work and, you know, try to make use of it in their own context. That's, I think, what any of us would want with work we produce. So anyway, but, but, but this cottage industry, you know, has gotten where is one of the, it has gotten more run than it should, and not that I could stop it, but I would like to to maybe more in an organized way add that to the list of thing things that um, uh, I I would like to get to to do um, because. Uh, Anyway, because as as is done in this piece here, even when there's some room made for my argument, there is this inability to break entirely free from this idea that 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 black people drive something with, with some legitimate power, drive the, the economy or drive the corporate world or drive popular culture. 
Uh, and on the one hand, we want to be proud of what we can, the impact we can have on, on the society, but I don't think recognizing enough what it doesn't do, what that, what that, what that influence does not do. For instance, uh, overturn material inequality, uh, for all the rise of hip hop, uh, and sneaker culture or black imagery or, or the mimicry of black performance, black communities are, are, have relatively no better off today than ever. So, um, uh, and so I, so I get to, you know, so I do get to be quoted here accurately as saying that the, the consumer base, that, that this is a consumer based economy, that this is a com consumer based economy does not mean that consumers have actual power. Um, and, uh, uh, to talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, because again, a lot of the focus of the story is on black business, on black businesses, black entrepreneurs, uh, black sneaker folks, and 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 um, uh, you know, fashion folks. Uh, but as I'm just trying, and and I and I appreciate that that, that they quoted me and, and brought in some of my argument here about this, but but it, because as I'm just quickly trying to say that what we need is policy that redistributes wealth. That we it doesn't matter if we have another you know sneaker program and I and I do make the point that there's nobody's catching Adidas and Nike, even white fashion folks can't catch Adidas and Nike. That's why Converse got bought up. That's why, um, you, you know, uh, 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 what is it? There's a handful, and two of them are, are brothers, Adidas and Puma. I think right, Adidas and Puma's founders are two brothers, white European brothers. So. Uh, uh, the idea that, that is, so again, even in, in, in the white world, there's no catching even a one family, never mind Nike, uh, and anybody else. So, so, so that, that, the, that they even get referenced as goals. So yeah, I mean, all this stuff is fly and I'm glad, you know, a handful of people are in here and they, you know, they, we, bring it back to my Adidas is, you know, uh, uh, and run DMC. And that was sort of the point I was trying to make that, that, that Adidas and run DMC and hip hop have had this relationship for decades. Black people are still poor. Black people don't own sneakers, don't own Adidas, don't benefit from the, 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 the sales of Adidas. The tens of billions that are produced every year from this association with hip hop and, and blackness don't, address the problems uh, of the distribution of the wealth that gets created. So ultimately the story shows, I mean, a lot of fly black people and that's, that's undeniable. There is a never, it's like a never ending uh, uh, production of flyness in, 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 in black communities. But at, by the end of this, the piece, it comes, it, it, it goes back to, you know, it's, it's away from anything that I was arguing. And then it, it comes back to here. This is an opportunity for us to own our ideas. Black culture created this phenomenon. That's why I hope uh, Black Lives Matter movement doesn't become a point in time, but instead an ongoing thing and that we push for equality and equity and support and create black business. So it, it, it by editing, by commentary, by focus, it becomes Black Lives Matter is legit politics and to, to see it is to support and develop more black business. So it, it sort of walks away from any of my own uh, uh, piece here, you know, or, or attempted a contribution, but, but sort of you, it, it, it also demonstrates the, the, the problem that I as a microcosm represent in all of this, like in the, in the sea of all this black flyness and uh, uh, you know, ingenious business and entrepreneurial effort and talent is this little argument that says, "Hey, by the way, this isn't going to work for the collective." And you can see why that not only in a story like this, but broadly speaking, arguments like mine get washed out. A lot of brilliant people have been making a, a version of this argument and better for a long time, but it's very difficult uh, to have those arguments uh, have the appropriate impact when they're wrapped in, in all that fly blackness and entrepreneurial spirit. And in the wrapping of by the story's end, we can business our way to Black Lives Matter, you know.
so to speak. So, all right. So I think he's back. Um, uh, uh, let's try again. Let's give it a shot again and see if Mr. Porter is back. Now we can hear you. Good morning, sir. How you doing? Uh oh. Yeah, I don't know. Now you're frozen. All right. Oh, man. We were just chatting before, too. So I don't know why. What happened? Um, anyway, we'll, we'll keep trying. We'll keep trying. Um, Anyway, so, uh, 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 yeah, we'll keep trying and see if we can get him back on. Um, so I saw a question. I did briefly see, I, th I thought I saw a question in the chat about, um, are, is Black Lives Matter, uh, is there some sort of brand arrangement deal? Um, and that's not what, what I got from this. I don't think that's what they're saying. What I think that what, what, what I, what I remember getting from the story and I, I could go back and look at it more closely, but is the, the point of the story is that, uh, again, black lives matter has just become a sort of uh, catch all phrase in many ways for any sort of black activism. So there are like, for instance, there are reference in here to, to some of the entrepreneurs who are, um, uh, um, here, I, let me just pull this back up because I, I do think it's, 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 uh, because I think what they're saying is where, where does that part begin? Um, for instance, I mean, like this guy, like they're owning franchises of bigger shoe stores and stuff like that. But, and what I think that they were saying was that because of the Black Lives Matter has become this catch all phrase that some of them have uh, tried to in, in speaking with Black Lives Matter folks. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 Martin Athletes Foot. Da, 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 da. Uh, for instance, this, this guy, Darius Billings, uh, created the strategic african-american retail track or start program uh which is designed to address loman and winter's points about helping create pathways for black entrepreneurs to become retail store owners so like this is sort of what i'm saying like to become a a retail store owner of uh of an athlete's foot chain To become a retail store owner in in a, of a broader chain is seen as a Black Lives Matter push, uh, but it's the same it's the same basic argument that so it's not that the Black Lives Matter has some official relationship so to speak, it's that the argument is that uh, these folks feel that they can engage. It's the same thing that I, I that I've been arguing and that many of have, have, have been arguing for a long time. The idea that we can engage political struggle, or we can engage social movements through entrepreneurialism. So what they're saying here is it, it's the same. It's the black capitalist approach to political struggle. So it's just the same thing. So, so then, and that, and that's sort of the point. Then here I come, and others, you know, uh, uh, a few of us try to enter and say, "I appreciate all the black flyness, and I appreciate the 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 black the black entrepreneurial desire. Whatever, I I appreciate it. I get it." It was even pushed as one of the as becoming a, a um, an element of hip hop, the hip hop entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurialism, hip hop entrepreneur was 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 even pushed. So I get it, but 
here I come and, and, and say, no, 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 that's not, you know, all this flyness, all this flyness, black business entrepreneurialism. And then, no, it's not going to work. We need policy. We need redistribution. We need power. Black capitalism doesn't help. Influencing the shoe community isn't power. It's a marketing engagement. And then it's right back to flyness, 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 beauty, flyness, 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 hotness, black business, black lives matter. And then of course, where you do have, and I did write about this and you can see it's, it's flourishing now, where you do have official relationships between, for instance, black lives matter and one United bank, the black owned, the largest black owned bank uh, and visa for the, the Black Lives Matter debit card, where you do have those official relationships, they come right back to a black entrepreneurial, black capitalist method or mode. So officially, unofficially, they do work well together, but but uh, I, I just did want to try to clarify it, at least that one uh, piece of it. All right, let's try. I think we let's try again with Mr. Porter and, and and see how that's working. How you doing, sir? Can we hear you? Are you there? Can you hear me? I'm I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm, yes, I can hear you. I hope you can hear me. Yeah, you just have a bad uh, lag, but I can hear you okay. well. I hope you can hear me. Uh, I, I think can, it's probably you... on my end, Jared. I'm going to mm -hmm. have to get a technical person in here and uh there's something that i'm obviously not doing that i should be doing i can't figure it out out everything is plugged in so can you hear me i i can it's just i a, guess you can hear me it's it's a all right it's just a bad lag and a freeze and i think uh i don't i, I don't know I, I don't know man uh what, what Mr. Porter, what you need is the 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 laptop and the 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 the, the Wi-Fi Ethernet cable, uh, and probably not to do it on your phone, to do it on the desktop, because uh, I don't think the phone connection is is strong enough. Um. All right, but let me get to let me get to this one other piece as as we see if 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 if, uh, if that can get worked out because. Um, I thought this was fascinating. So we got word. Uh, now, this was not something that I was interviewed for, but word came down and uh, shout out to uh, Terhaka Love. I hope I'm saying that right. The author here of the revolutionary black media companies shattering the glass ceiling story in the Daily Beast. Uh, again, we'll put the link to that uh, in the show notes as well. Uh, the story was published yesterday. And uh, the Brooklyn-based fashion label Telfar made waves when it launched Telfar TV, a 24-7 television service. It's one of many Black-owned networks challenging the traditional traditional media model. Um and the story starts last month, Telfar announced that in it, that its first duffel bag would be exclusively available through a QR code on its new 24 seven on demand television service, Telfar TV, a satellite beaming, a satellite beaming the product over cell phones across the country. The QR code will flash for 60 seconds, uh, allow Telfar not only to introduce the new service, but also to re reduce an exploitative secondhand market that could bot its way to dozens of bags and thousands of dollars with the tap of a key. So that's fascinating. Uh, uh, I honestly don't know much about Telfar, um, but uh, uh, the 24-7 the TV is still a curious one for the Telfar, for Telfar Clemens, Brooklyn-based genderless clothing company. Telfar decided to pave its own brand building path, eschewing the print route 
of fashion brands like Net A Porter or Spawn Con podcasts like Victoria's Secrets recently announced VS Voices and instead partnered with the distributors like Apple TV, Roku, Roku Google Play and to find our, its way to our homes. OK, so that's where the story starts. But then it gets it gets really more for me, more interesting. But the model specifically as an app and a TV channel is one that black media have increasingly turned to in the 2010s, a period that has been defined by curation and cultivation of digital communities that exist beyond social media. Telfar is the latest in a wave of channels like Black Network Channel. I think they got that. And similar joints like Epitome Media Group and ding, 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 Black Power Media. What? Leaping out of the abyss of white-owned television and seeking to create a new pantheon of Black independent companies filling the void left by white corporate interests in tech and digital media. What? Fascinating. Now, what I thought was even more interesting is that the article ends up, and again, it's pretty long. Obviously, I'm not going to read the entire whole thing. Yeah, that's what I thought. They got it's not black network channel, black news channel. So that was a little typo earlier. But what they end up doing is what I have and we have been 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 explaining is our purpose uh, since day one. That is not only the goal wasn't just to be black owned and black run uh, and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the goal has been to provide an alternative to what is often described or, or limited, limited in its definition of black media. That is black media can often in terms of definition be media that is white owned or owned by non-black people that targets black audiences. Black media can also be black owned that be, be, be media that are, that are black owned, but that are uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, merely commercial in focus and goal and design and intent. So I really appreciated that this article went on to say um, the growth of that the growth of black owned channels in the last decade seems to be sort of widening a sort of widening of the lens. Consider spots like Black News Channel and Black Power Media, two companies who po whose political and cultural allegiances couldn't be farther apart from one another. I was really glad that they pointed this out. Consider spots like Black News Channel. BNC and Black Power Media, BPM, two companies whose political and cultural allegiances couldn't be further apart from one another. The former, founded by a former Black Republican congressman and football player, J.C. Watts, and the latter, a Black media conglomerate committed to the Black radical tradition of folks like Black Panther Kwame Ture and former president of Ghana, the Pan-Africanist Kwame Nkrumah. Now, the author could have done us even a more of a solid and said, you know, because uh, if you're going to name J.C. Watts and give his background, you could have said that, you know, something like Ear Doctor, Kalanji Changa, Kamal Franklin and Jared Ball with decades of activism, academic, journalistic and community engagement. You know, he could have you could have thrown something in there like that. But more importantly. So I do need to credit the author here. More importantly, they drew out the political differences between a black Republican and billionaire funded operation and one. I don't know who Epit Epitome Media Group is, but and one founded with our politics. So BNC's programming follows a traditional cable model and centers around its morning show. Start your morning with Sharon and Mike and evening show with Mark Lamont Hill. Black News Tonight. BNC is meant to act as a nonpartisan peek into black life, which means it runs the gamut from progressive politics to platforming very questionable personalities like Dr. Umar Johns. He does have a doctorate. And sexual assault apologists like Judge Joe Brown. I did like that line because that was crazy. In the spirit, in the spirit of good natured debate. Watson BNC, who did not respond to requests for comment, did we were we invited to comment? Seek to transcend 
the partisan divide by giving space to thought leaders and controversial opinions. On the other hand, dun, 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 Black power media has a strong anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist ideological posture that produces constant conversation with ideas, theories, and practices. And while it hasn't reached the point of 24-7 broadcasting, its YouTube channel is almost completely live streamed. It's very easy to imagine that black power media could make the transition to 24 seven live streams. if the resources and programming allowed for it. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and by the way, that's exactly right. So part of what the article is talking about, and it's a, just a little bit of context for that last comment. Part of what the article is talking about is the um, the the sort of new wave of live versus uh, uh, on demand programming, uh, and uh, that there there is this idea that 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 live programming is 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 key, uh, and that twenty four seven live streaming is ultimately the goal um and uh um so so uh and we do attempt that that is that would be the goal here obviously that that is part of what we are intending to get to and would love to once we um uh yeah once you know continue to expand, you know, and hopefully capture some of those resources that we don't have access to because we don't have capitalist, any true capitalist engagement, or certainly no venture capital investment, uh, no billionaire co-founder as uh, the former, as does uh, BNC, because it's not just J.C. Watts, uh, but it's the, uh, the, the, the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars uh, that's involved there. So as we've talked about already, politically, they can't, they're not going to be able to go where, where, um, uh, we are interested in going. So that's why I was saying earlier, even though all of us or several of us have morning programs uh, and, and we'll continue to expand both the remix in terms of, of, of length and days offered. Um, I don't feel, and I don't mean this in any, you know, uh, sideways way. I mean, I really don't see it as competition because we are, uh, programming to a different segment of the billions of people globally uh, and, and in the African world that don't have any programming geared towards them, uh, to their to a certain set of politics uh, and ideas uh, with which they would like to be more engaged. So that's who we're programming for. Uh, so we, I, don't, I don't see us as being in competition with, with others who have a, a different and, and broader politics and base so it also presents us with certain challenges in terms of growth as well i mean we recognize that so we're going to continue to 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 work with that as well and we so uh um uh and to that end we do encourage as much support as possible so definitely click like share subscribe and join if you can and um help us continue to to uh to to expand yeah all right so um all right good so let's take a quick so i i think we're we're, we're going to try again a different day with mr porter and, but but uh um dr burrows has popped up so let's take a quick break and we'll come back a little early with him and he says he's got some good hate to get us started with anyway so that's so, so, so you know how we do we don't want to delay that here so a quick break back in just a second here that I mix what I like. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, everybody, you already know who it is. It's Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs here at I Mix What I Like. He is a, a, a longtime uh, journalist, black journalist, uh, historian, uh, professor of African-American studies and author and curator at drums in the global village.com uh, and forthcoming more forthcoming work work on mumia abu jamal and he's here to talk with us in a, just a couple of minutes about a new uh set of book reviews he's published for us at i mix what i like.org 
But you said in the private chat, Dr. Burroughs, that you had some hate to get us started with this morning. So, oh, let's, I have let's, so let's, much to say. I have so, so let's much get to say. there. Before so let's we get even it. get before we even get to the book review, which, as you know, is filled with hate, I got some pre hate. <laughs> we love it. Pre hate first of all, on. First of all be, be, before, before I do that, I, I just want to say something very serious. I've been monitoring several things right now. One of the things I've been monitoring is um, what's going on in Philadelphia uh, mm -hmm. because Russell Maroon Schultz is very near mm -hmm. death. And there is an emergency rally uh, that they're having uh, tomorrow morning because there is some sort of new hearing. And um, on yeah, Facebook, just, yep, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no I was going to say he was just granted clemency. Uh, I'm pulling up the Facebook thing now, but okay, good, uh, good. Uh, go ahead. That was it. No, no, because see, I, I I didn't know that because so, I I saw this Facebook thing from last night from his daughters, and it, and it reads 78 year old Russell Maroon Schultz is dying. Feeding feeding tube has been removed. He's unable to walk, barely able to speak, and and it goes into the whole thing with the Abolitions Law Center. So so he did get some some release. Is that what you're saying? He got he got clemency uh, okay. for compassionate release or oh, he good. Got cleared for compassionate release. But mm -hmm. but as you're saying here, I mean, it's 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 another one. of the, It seems like another one of those, you know, like, you know, we let him out just to pass situations. It's 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 anyway. They, they, I, yeah, they, they definitely don't. Yeah, they definitely don't want him to. Um, the embarrassment of, of him dying in jail clearly uh that's that's part of it um well okay so you you know about that that's good so let me get to the hate uh democracy now is wrapping up and i was quite shocked and disappointed because their uh last segment and by the way i just want to put quickly this this link to what I still think this emergency rally might happen, the brother uh, Sonny. So, in other words, Todd was just confessing he was not watching my first. No, no, hour. He was no, no. I would, I, 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 now, I, 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 which, I is, was which is why, which is already why he <laughs> violated already. <laughs> but I was, so I was monitoring. So, if it was whack, that's what you get. <laughs> no, I, I was monitoring several things this morning. Democracy Now was one of them, and yes, you are right. It is whack because here's, here's my hate. Democracy Now. Um, we just finished talking about a uh, tribunal, and I was thinking, oh yeah, tribunal. Okay, they're gonna they're gonna talk about the black tribunal that just happened over the weekend with Nikichi Taifa, and they were talking about you know the the spirit of Mandela. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know where the king was involved right, too. Right, 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 and uh, right, and you know the the we charge genocide and all of that. They didn't even mention that tribunal. They're talking about Julian Assange right now. Yeah. And I'm like, how are you gonna talk about Julian Assange when Russell Maroon Schultz is like near death? Can't you even just put a line in in the intro or whatever? I'm like, come on, democracy now. You used to be much better than this. Come on. I I was very, very disappointed. No, uh, they but... really fell off. Uh and I mean again, I had you know, I had I had started listening to them in the '90s, you know, like and 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 Samari Marksman and all, like right, like when, right. like it, it, it it's unrecognizable. And right. again, years ago, I think it was her first book at the time. Amy Goodman published a book, and in the the forward, she praises Marksman and the Pan Africanists. Right. She literally says the Pan Africanists. Who helped support Democracy Now and 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 BAI and all this other stuff and and Pacifica and that you would have no look again now and I, now and I think that's the no funniest idea. thing right you'd have no Not idea that, she doesn't even talk about she won't even correct another host when mispronouncing Aaron Mate's name. And asking Amy Goodman, will Aaron Mate be invited back on to democracy, ever be invited on to Democracy Now, his former employer, uh, uh, to talk about the differences in their views of Syria, Russia Gate, etc. Amy wouldn't even correct the, the woman in, in when she called him Aaron Mate. <laughs> <laughs> let me let, let me let me point some things out that are not popular. Cause see. You did such a good job this last hour. I did. I did check out your last hour. I, I saw the very un, I saw the very unpopular things you said about hip hop. I was thinking about all those people who made careers and hundreds of thousands of dollars off of hip hop. They were they were very displeased with you, and I'm sure you're very happy with that. 
Let me say a couple of, of things about democracy now. Democracy now when it first came out, because I listened to it when it first came out, because I remember yeah. it replaced the Julianne Malvo show. That's right. right. And I, so, yeah, I vaguely okay, remember that. Okay, no, no, let's yeah. let's go, let's go with democracy. Wow. Let's, let's bring it. No, let's bring it. Let's bring it all away. So I remember. When hey, and a lot of us at the time would have thought that was good. Right. No, is no, you know, other right. than a black woman. That's right. not it. <laughs> right. Right. And and her guest host had an excellent show on Mumia that I that I that I talk about in, in an article I I have not yet published about Mumia and NABJ. But that's a whole other topic. So let's go with Democracy Now. So Democracy Now first came out. It said its motto was the exception to the rulers. Yep. When Amy Goodman published her first book with Disney, because you know she has a Disney contract, Mumia Abu Jamal, my biographical That's subject, right. was she talked about Mumia in the context of we fight censorship. And to show you that we fight censorship, here's us backing up Mumia and losing what was back then one third of our affiliates because the Temple University station WRTI uh, did not want to air Mumia Abu Jamal. They had signed for Democracy Now! But when they found out they were going to air Mumia Abu Jamal, just like they did with NPR, they cut them off. And see, when they cut off W, when they cut off Democracy Now from WRTI, Democracy Now lost one third of its affiliates. Now, yeah. three books later, and all Mumia Abu Jamal is now is, oh, he's the representative of prisoners. Yeah. See that very subtle change, and and Democracy Now went from being exception to the rulers to um, what do they call themselves now? A global independent news hour. That's because because how because uh, I, I used to say the, breaking the corporate sound right, barrier, right? All of that and, stuff. And I remember yeah. when I remember when Chomsky was on it, and, and he was talking to me, and he said, you know, and you know, as a as a as a radical leftist news outlet, and she said, no, 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 we are an independent <laughs> news hour. See, that's that's funding. That's funding right there. In fact, I remember one show where she literally said, and I almost. You know, I, I eat breakfast in democracy now. I almost choked. Um, I wouldn't be here because she said something like, our motto is we're news with a heart. And I'm sitting here going, yo, what? <laughs> news with a heart? News with a heart. She literally said that in one of those shows. I was like, what Dude, is going on here? <laughs> she gave the same advice from the people that used to tell M what was it? MFN <laughs> right, MFN 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 Lean, what was it? Lean, lean in, lean in. Lean no, lean in, lean in, right, right, right. Yeah, well, they, yeah, yeah, well, well, heart. well, what? MSNBC, MSNBC leaned in, all right? They leaned in all the way out, and now they got a, they got a sister running it, and the sister is trying to figure out how to make it more newsy while trying to figure out how to uh, replace, um, um, what's her name, the the star of MSNBC, what's her name? Rachel Maddow, mm. Rachel Maddow, right? But let me let me get back to what I was going to originally say before I was enraged by by democracy now. Uh, I want Dr. Ball, I wanted to publicly congratulate uh, the Black Power Media Collective. I did see the uh, Daily Beast article, and I was very happy uh, to see that. Uh, I know you have a huge uh, publicity budget, so I know you know you thank your <laughs> very large, you know, publicity team, right? You know, yeah, man, for, for for getting you in there. No, I mean what you what you've done with the what the collective have done is quite astounding. I mean, I, I, I do think that, you know, you make one major error, and I'll, I'll have no problem saying this on the air. I, I think that your your standards waiver, because you, you don't go from having Patrice Lumumba's daughter on yesterday to having Comic Book Guy on right now. I mean, that's that's not that's not a good, you know, connection. We I cover the whole, the whole, the whole <laughs> gamut. And, right, right, and, right. And, and, and even your comic book work, Right. dismisses would dis disprove you as just the comic book guy right right uh, it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a it's a i don't know what what it would be like a a a, a black radical political economy of comics is is i don't know what what your work is but with that so but i but i do want to uh, congratulate you yeah. and i think that that what you've done is very important um and and you know i know that that uh you know, subscribers and, and supporters. I mean, and let me tell you, I, I I haven't told you this yet, and I should tell you this privately, but I I have no problem telling you this publicly. Uh, you have great fans with the uh, uh, campaign coalition to free Mumia Abu Jamal. I mean, they mention Black Power Media almost weekly in their uh, conference calls. 
So they are they are very um, happy with the fact that they know they have a forum uh, if something goes down. And and you know that's something that I should have told you privately, but I think it's important to tell you tell you publicly. I don't mind. I appreciate that. And I think I mean, but it, I, on some level, it makes sense. I mean, you, you know, and 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 I think with with all due deference to 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 my co-founders, I think between Kalanji and Kamal, uh, in particular, they have had a, a reach. Uh, and an insider involvement with with these organizations in politics for a long time uh and to a lesser extent i have uh so i mean it makes sense and we would of course want to be an outlet for people fighting for mumia and other political prisoners uh and hopefully we can expand and and do more but that's exactly you know so anyway well, i appreciate like, it, it though yeah. sure well it, it looks like with maroon sadly um Black Power Media is going to get a chance to um, be of utility again, unfortunately. And I mean, you know, and and by the way, it, again, it, it speaks to, uh, I mean, this was a problem going back years for me because my my criticism of democracy now started um, with with really what it was. And 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 I think this is in, in many ways, uh, um, what, what would this be like a, a metaphor for a lot of different things but the more i got involved with activist politics mm -hmm. the less valuable i saw democracy now mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and one of the glaring omissions that that i saw almost immediately was that they didn't they don't cover uh or at the time even when they were more progressive they don't cover mm -hmm. a lot of the black radical world they don't engage a lot of the black radical world didn't you do a uh, study that showed how little they covered black people how they always have the a study, black segment at the end right <laughs> well no it wasn't even that deep of a study i just did uh -huh. the basic the uh -huh. very basic first step of a, mm -hmm. of a of a of a media analysis right and because there was that years ago there was that story that came out that said uh the sunday the sun it was called sunday morning apartheid right it was about how I the mainstream that. news shows don't have mm -hmm. black guests mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. by using their method of just simply counting shows and black appearances i did the same thing with democracy now which obviously airs more time five days a week as opposed to just one on sunday uh um, and I didn't uh, account for the fact that the, the few, the black guests that they have would be better than the black guests that would be on NBC or CBS. Right, right. But but in terms of ratio of shows to guests, Democracy Now! was worse. Right. Like you were right. black guests. Right. And, it's, and so that was, that's what I was like, I was like, this is what I'm saying. I was like, you're on five days a week. Uh, and, and even and, and by, by percentage, you know, and I do know through mutual friends that one of their superstar producers at the time saw what I had written and laughed it off and dismissed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and now has since gone on to his own, I think, you know, um, marginal wannabe superstar career. Mm -hmm. But but he didn't say I was wrong. He just right, said right. he just he just laughed it off as not being important. Uh, so anyway, I mean, I just I, look. You know, and I and I do like to make fun of the fact that the only time I've personally been mentioned on, on by Amy Goodman on that show is when I was thrown up as a straw for the late Vincent Harding to 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 destroy uh, um, in absentia. I was thrown up as a, in, in name only as a straw argument for for Vincent Harding uh, to 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 dismantle. But well, you anyway, know, let me let me, let me just say you that know. you got you got more play on NPR's Morning Edition. Than you got on Democracy Now. Audience, I don't hey, know if but, you know that. I don't know if you know. Well, that. what maybe, but but one 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 other little piece to my own personal story is sure, that I sure. applied it, when I was in grad school. I applied to Democracy Now to be mm. Uh, mm. a producer, mm. and uh, I got a phone call from somebody, mm. and the issue at the time was that I didn't live in New York. Um, and I, you know, they were like, "Would you be willing to move?" And I said, "Well, you know, depends on the the offer, right? You know, like, I, like I, like I, I'd be down to move to New York, absolutely." But, but that was the only call I got. So anyway, <laughs> well, right, so um, look, the, the, we, me, we got me, the pre hate done. Audience is just a pre hate. Now we're going to get to the hate hate. So here's the hate hate. I'm pulling <laughs> it up here. Pull it up. Uh, 
uh, the, 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 your review of these two books, uh, Say mm -hmm. Their Names, How Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter, How Black Lives Came to Matter in America, mm -hmm. uh, and The Matter of Black Lives, mm -hmm. uh, edited by Jelani Cobb and David Remnick for mm -hmm. The New Yorker. And uh, it, as we discussed, it is too long to read. In, right, in right. Ireland, it is. So I just wanted to. I just wanted it to is. to to start with the with with your title, mm -hmm. uh, um, well, with with your opening here, uh, mm -hmm. where I highlighted a couple, just a couple of interesting. So I want you to, I want you to give an overview of what it is you've said here, but I wanted to start by asking you to do so in the context of, of you <laughs> describing. Uh, the New Yorker magazine's very distinguished Negro files. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then in, and then in this one paragraph, you say, scribe common sense alert. If anyone can see and has seen the moving picture in his or her minds, then any words that trail behind have to be powerful and contextual, con, con and textual, contextual, they have to take you into new places with the force of a James Baldwin light with the force of a James Baldwin lighting strike, lightning, lightning strike, lightning strike or a Zora Neale Hurston tornado. Sadly, no one told this to Bunn, Cotman, Gaines, Charles and Harrison or their editor who have together managed to time travel the time travel feat of producing a book located somewhere between the first expanded Wikipedia entry and a lost 1999 issue of Emerge magazine. So there's a lot of hate just in that <laughs> little beginning. So I want you to explain what it is you're talking about, starting with these very distinguished Negro files. Um, I'm going to explain tell us what, what's going on here. I'm yeah. going to explain all of that, Dr. Ball. But first, let me let me go behind the curtain. Let me let the audience go behind the curtain mm -hmm. as to to how I operate. When I get up in the morning. My first thought is, how can I best be like my hero, Fred Rogers? Now, I'm, Fred I'm, not, Rogers. Kidding. I'm not kidding. I have I have a Fred Rogers book on uh, on my uh, coffee table. I'm not kidding. I I watch all his documentaries. I love the Tom Hanks movie. I think that in Mr. Fact, Rogers' Neighborhood. That's what we're fact, talking about. Here. That's what we're talking about. In fact, if if there were grants to study him as a media producer, I would apply for one. And I don't care where I'd have to move. I wouldn't. I I would want to study him, right? Because I think he has a lot of of you know spiritual clarity, right? As a, as wow. a white guy, no, I, I really mean that. Now, so wait, wait, wait. Just, I just want to quit. We we have to at some point. You have to come. We have to have a, like an actual conversation about this. No, like, we do because I we do because I because I think that that mm -hmm. him as a rich white man, because remember the first thing he did, Doctor Ball, was do what you did. He rejected media hegemony. Mm -hmm. He went he went to go study media and said, "This is the worst thing I've ever seen, and this poisons people." Mm -hmm. And there's no way I would ever participate in this. So as a rich white guy, he actually then set up his own framework. He went and got degrees in psychology. I mean, he, he did the whole thing. And we can disagree as Africans in terms of his approach. And, and I think we could have a vigorous discussion about that. But in terms of his sincerity and in terms of his critique, because his critique was a leftist critique. Mm -hmm. Even even in the Tom Hanks film, you see a clip where Tom Hanks is 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 imitating him and I guess quoting him, saying, uh, "Television is making babies grow up to be consumers." So he That's had to he had to critique right there, right? No, I knew he he right. was a hero in my household. I don't right. I don't disagree. I, I I think it's more just a uh, it's just the oddity of the the choice. This is shocking, right? This, this is shocking, right? Point. This is shocking, yeah. right? I, I like to entertain the audience, Dr. Ball. Yes. I do. Now, so let me so let me say, so I always start from that point, right? So I don't get up in the morning saying, what can I hate on? What can I write a devastating paragraph? Like that devastating paragraph. I don't, I don't seek that out, right? But here's what happens, and, and I know you've talked about this, other people in Black Power Media have talked about this. Black people who know better make conscious choices to not approach topics and not approach movements and not approach things that will cause conflict, right? So for instance, a journalist 
can write all day about, let's say, construction work, right? And they have no problem if they find out things that, that they would be critical of construction work, they would write about those things critically, right? They'd have no problem with that. If they were talking about their own lives, they would have no problem going deep into their own lives, talking about racism and how that impacts the problems that they've had. And, you know, I, I recently just finished binging um, a documentary series about the people who control my county in New Jersey. Uh, some of you may have heard of it. It's the called Sopranos. The Sopranos. <laughs> right, it's called Sopranos. <laughs> right. No, no, no. Now that I've seen it, I only saw a couple of episodes. But you now that I've the, the documentary, HBO documentary no, series, no, is what no. you're calling I, it. <laughs> I usually just saw a couple of episodes, but now that I've seen it, it is absolutely a documentary series. Because let's remember, <laughs> let's remember Chase. The, the creator showrunner, David Chase, that is not his la real last name. That is not his birth last name. Chase is Italian. Like... Chase is a, his, his, his real last name is like Cerviz or something like that. Wait a minute. It's or not just Jews know? that change their last name. Oh, you didn't know this? Oh, you, oh, Italian you didn't know this? Italian do it too? Italian what do it too. Because remember, because remember, what is the subtext? It, what, 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 what is the it, subject? It no, no. or something? <laughs> <laughs> it's Cervisi or something like that. So, so the Sopranos is him telling on his people in New Jersey. He's telling everything. He's telling every secret, right? So, so you know, so so and so anyway. But but one of the things I appreciate about yeah. the Sopranos is that thank you, the, the Cesar. That's right, two thirty five worldwide. That's his last. That's his real last name. What is it? Hold on, I got it. I got it. Go oh, there. There uh, it is. That's his, <laughs> that's his real last name, right? They say there. <laughs> right, right. The and, Caesar? <laughs> is his name really the Caesar? So, David the Caesar? <laughs> so, so, and he's from North Cornwall, right? And see, he knows that all the Italians and all those places in Nessus County are all one or two generations away from Newark, right? That's why Newark is always at the center of the Sopranos. But one of the things I want to say that, that I'm making this point here, because I am getting to what your paragraph, is that David Chase in The Sopranos is, is unapologetically racist. He's racist as, as the method of, like, in other words, I can't tell this story honestly, right, if I don't show the complete worldview of these Italians. So I'm watching all this racism in The Sopranos, and I'm laughing because I'm like, David Chase, you're an excellent artist. Did you watch you, the, wait a minute though, hold up. Did you see, did you see this new one though? The movie, I was just about to get to that. Do you want to get to that? Okay. Do you want to get to that? Oh, no, no, I mean, we- No, no, we, no. we can get to it. No, we got to now, you brought <laughs> it up. Cause it's let's all about the now. hate. They bring in, now real quick. Now real let's quick. Let's let the hate flow. Let's let the hate flow. Because we're going to come back to the, the review. We're not leaving. Yeah, we're going to come back. We're going to come back. It's all about the same thing. Right. It is. But, it is. But, but just real quick. Right. One of the one of the uh, uh, explanations of right. this Saints of Newark prequel movie right. Right. that I saw said that David De Caesar <laughs> has, has, has his original goal right. Right. was to make a film about the Newark riots. Right. Right. He never got that off no. in the way he would have wanted to and then right. ended up smashing that into a prequel, right. with it, which is why we got what we ended up getting with the Saints right. of Newark, right. which which he should have, if he, he should have done his separate racist Newark riots movie and left that out of this and done a full prequel, uh, uh, proper prequel, and that would have been much better. But this thing didn't work for me. But anyway, that's well, all I wanted to well, say. Well, let, ahead. Me, let ahead. me say, let me say that I'm, I'm going to say a couple of things that, that I'll disagree with you on and might be controversial. Okay. First of all, I don't know if you know, but HBO is already signing him up. They're going to do, they're, they're going to mm -hmm. do a prequel series. Absolutely. So, so this movie was just a teaser, right? Mm -hmm. I kept reading all this hate about this movie. I said, man, this movie must be awful, right? And so I watched the movie, and, and again, I just I literally just finished binging it like two weeks before watching the movie. So I'm literally knowing all the episodes that he's pulling from in the first half. Because the first half hour of this movie, he's just extending what he did in one or two episodes, right? But as the movie went along, 
I thought it was really interesting because he was showing, now he wasn't showing the politics of Mary Baraka or the Committee of Uni, for Unified Newark or whatever, he wasn't doing that. But he did throw in some little Gil Scott Heron. He, he had some people mm -hmm. imitate the last poets. Mm -hmm. And so he was saying, okay, this black movement is coming and this black movement is gonna replace, this black mafia is going to replace this Italian mafia. And if you notice the end of that movie, the black people won. Mm -hmm. They took over the numbers racket, the Italians gave up, and they and they moved up to the county, to Essex, to Essex County. And and by the way, that is symbolically what literally happened. Even Amiri Baraka admitted when when uh, Ken Gibson got elected in 1970 that you know we won because white people didn't want to live here anymore. And by white people, he mm -hmm. meant Italians, right? Mm -hmm. Um. Another thing I want to say is that is that I love the subtext of the Sopranos because David, uh, what's my man's name again? The, the Caesar, right? The, 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 the Caesar. Right, right. That's how I'm pronouncing it. Right. How the Caesar? How they're clear on the fact that they're not white yet, mm -hmm. and and anybody that's confused about that, you know, just watch the episode on Columbus because. Because remember, mm -hmm. AJ in that episode, because that, that episode is called Christopher. See, again, I just watched this. That episode is called Christopher. AJ not, is not only seen reading Howard Zinn. Right. He's quoting. But he reads, out, he reads Howard Zinn out loud, saying, mm -hmm. they will be easier to subjugate. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, whoa. But see, they're clear. Like, they, they want to be white. And and even when the when the when the psychiatrist sits down with her her family the middle these the middle class Italians right that are that are, think they're better than the than the Sopranos Italians even they say you know it's people like them meaning the gangsters is why we can't have an Italian president that's right they say it that's right so they know they're not white they get it listen. The Caesar did a number of things with that show that I liked, like yes, for instance, absolutely. that I thought absolutely. were slick. Absolutely. For instance, there was that one episode that opens up with 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 black kids hijack or carjack in a white family, right? And then the very next cut to scene is them dropping it off the car off at Sopranos Chop Shop. So it 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 starts you off with the traditional racism, right? Uh, right. The, the the racist trope of black teenage or black right. youth, black men right. carjacking the innocent white family. If I remember correctly, they even had the little children there. Like they, they and, went all in on the white family. And the white like father yells. That. And the white father yells, "Niggers." Niggers. That? Exactly. Like, like one of the they, only they, few. One only few references to niggers. That's right. That's right. They always talk about Muyan, Muyan, Muli. Muyan. But, but this time but, they but just said was, niggers. Right. Well, because this was this wasn't the street Italians. That right. was the point. Right. Like they're showing you the, right. the pristine white family right. who will of course say nigger. They're not gonna right. say Mulyan. Right. So, right. So, right. So, right. so so they <laughs> but the very next scene, so they're trying to make that subtle white liberal point. Right. So I got right. it. I was right. like, I right. see you, I see right. you, white liberal. Right. Right. Caesar. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so, but that's the limits of it. That's it. Right. That's it. So, it, but what I most liked about the Sopranos is that right. for the most part, other than scenes like that, a few right. scenes like that, there are no black people. And that's no, what no, I like. that's right. Me that's too. what I want. Me too. In my white TV. Me I don't too. Want the Absolutely. Fake. That's why I didn't want him doing <laughs> right, the, right. The, the Newark thing in the Saints joint. Right, I was right. like, no. Right, right, right. Let these no. talented black actors have their own. Right, hey, right, right. Don't try to smash this right, right, and you're right. gonna fuck it all up. Anyway. Right, right. No, no, I, I hear you know the fact that the Sopranos is all white is a great advantage. And the fact that they don't like they don't like black people. They either don't like black no. people a lot or they don't like black people a little. The fact that they don't like black people is refreshing. Yeah. Right. And it's honest in right, the fact that right. there are no black characters, they don't interact. Right. So right. you don't have to deal with the bullshit. Right. That's, that's even what I used to like about right. Reinfeld. <laughs> right. the most honest New York show ever. Right. Right. The white right. folks right. have no black friends in the white, in the black right. city on the planet. That right. tells you all you need to know. So of right. course Richards was going to come out calling people niggers. I was like, if you could have just kept that to yourself, <laughs> I'd still watch the replay. Right, you right. I, know. I can't even do that anymore. Anyway. Right. Well, anyway, now I have to get to your hate. Get okay, to the hate. let's go. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me say this. Let me say this, Doctor Ball. You know, you're a major Africana scholar. 
and you know i'm just a fledgling africana scholar right i'm i'm just starting out right so i learned a lot of my africana studies from from black media and from the streets right and one of the things I learned from, you know, your street brothers were very well educated, you know, studying under Dr. Clark and all that. You know, the the, the brother told me, um, well, you know, I mean, you know, you talked about the African spirituality and the connection with nature and all of that. And, and he talked about, you know, that if you use a tree, if you use a tree's wood, right, for for some for some sort of utilitarian purpose, as an African, you might have to go and commune with that tree. Hmm. And he said it even deeper. He said, you might have to go pray to that tree and let that tree know, like, okay, I'm going to sacrifice you for the, the greater good. I'm going to take your wood and I'm going to use it for, for utilitarian purposes. Because we know that in African society, everything has a utilitarian purpose, including art, uh, relations, et cetera, personal relations, et cetera. So I'm saying that to say, while readings say their names, I mourned for that tree. Mm. I mourned that a tree was sacrificed for this book. Damn. You went a long way for that. That was a that was a Chappelle, <laughs> that's Chappelle level storytelling joke making. You went a long way for the punchline on that one. Uh now, but you mentioned that. I mean, you now, do mention that in here. I'll explain you why. Oh, so, let's, the effect. so let's go through the yeah, highlights because I'll I'll explain why. So I did not so, move. But who by... who is the very distinguished Negro oh, files? Oh my like, god, who, who is comprises not... these files? And who why is... is this important? Who is not in and this why... New York? Who is not in this New Yorker profile? I mean, this New Yorker book. I mean, New York New Yorker book is like 800 pages. You got Jelani Cobb, you got James Baldwin, you have uh uh Tony Morrison, you have Henry Louis Gates. I mean, you you have you know Hinton Owls. I mean, you have the, the and what are they studded... talking about? They're talking about Black Lives Matter. Or, or, no, or showing no. us how we got to Black Lives Matter? What, what no, is no, it's a it's a collection of all their articles about Black people or their best articles about Black people. Oh my God. So they, they've marketed, so they've marketed the Black Lives Matter situation as let us show you our contribution to, oh, the, so the, to the racial okay. discussion, right? So that's where the very distinguished. Uh, oh, so this is follow. perfect because then because so 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 last hour. So when I'm talking about right. sneakers, right, being, and and black business and selling sneakers being Black Lives Matter, this is this is uh, uh, this is another commercial uh, corporate attempt to tell us uh, how black they are. So how now, black Newsweek and 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 elite media are anyway my that bad. is absolutely Please. that's absolutely correct and by the way as a lover of narrative nonfiction journalism i was all for it i mean when i when i saw mm -hmm. uh cobb uh posting on tw on twitter i immediately went to get a review copy i said i want this you know i want to read this because you like these folks and this is where we often disagree and our biggest thing would be as you would say going back years to when our offices used to right. actually right. literally be next right. door to each other right uh you would say they have a right dr ball they have let, a right to say what they're saying. And I'd be let like, me, let me explain. You'd be like, no, nah, you don't understand. Let yeah. me explain my non-complex relationship with black journalism. All right. And, and it's non-complex. I don't know how many church folks you have in your audience, right? But there are people, as you know, Dr. Ball, they're the most radical, militant, unread, everything, Dr. Ben, whatever, whatever. But they are not leaving their AME church. Right? I have to admit, one of my limitations is that all of black media is my AME church. So as hard as I am on these people right now, I still respect them. Because see, the reason I was so hard on these folks, and, and let me give you why, let me give you the reason why, is because I've read some of their books. I know what they can do. Let me give you one example, because you know we're here to hate, so let's let's roll with it. Michael Cobman. Mm -hmm. Michael Cobman is a dedicated black man. Michael Cobman did a book called The Wreck of the Henrietta Marie. Mm. You might have heard that title. There's another, it goes under two titles because I think it went in the paperback and became another title. But one of the titles is The Wreck of the Henrietta Marie. Michael Cobman 
went underwater, went down to the surface of the earth to look at a slave ship with some black divers. And he wrote an entire book about what he saw there and how that affected him. And it was a very good book, right? Um, because black journalists don't have these kind of New Yorker magazines and Esquire magazines where they can make fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars for an article, right? They they turn they turn out these books that really would be better as twenty-five thousand word articles, right? Mm. And and I thought, by the way, the record of Henry and Marie, as much as I love that book, I just read it saying, you know, this would have this would have been better as a twenty-five thousand word article. And I like Michael Cotman because he was on. I think it was either Diane Reem or Kojo Namdi. This is this is NPR of DC, where he said he went to a bar and a and he, a white person came up and started talking to him, and you know he was telling the white person what he was doing and you know what he was thinking, and the white person said, "Well, just don't forget that tell tell in your book that blacks own slaves too." And Cotman asked the guy, um, "What do you do?" And the guy said what he did, and Cotman said to the guy, "Look." I won't tell you how to do your job and you won't tell me how to write this book. Oh, wow. And Cotman is a tall dude. And I know, I know he looked at that dude very clearly and let him know that, you know, like, look, we're going, we're going, we're going to continue this. We can continue this one way or the other. So like, I, I know these people, Dr. Ball, that's why I'm sympathetic with them, but that's also, and I've known these people, by the way, in many cases for 20, 30 years, right? I'm a former NABJ internship winner. I'm a former NABJ scholarship winner, right? I was one of the first five to 10 people to ever win both those awards. In the NABJ scholarship, I won the top, in, I mean, the NABJ internship, I won the top internship that they offered in print, right? So I, I know these people, they're my family. But, but the flip side of that is, as we all know, when you get angry with your family, <laughs> you get really angry with your family, right? So I couldn't believe that these writers with all this great talent, et cetera, like they were so happy that this, I'm assuming, white publisher approached them and their deadline was so tight that they just reverted to rote, right? Mm. Where they knew better, but they didn't do better. And my thing is, if you had time to do all this journalism, newspaper journalism that's a year and a half late, two years late, that doesn't have an impact, you had time to tell what you really thought, to really examine the phenomenon. I mean, because you, you, you said but, here, just I just one of the highlights I have here. So where sure, so sure. you ask, where's the throne spear in white America's heart that Eldridge Cleaver said black writing should be? That courage is absent because the established late 20th century black journal authors way too happy to be relevant again, think their quoted experts are important and their conclusions sufficiently sober. These essays may be more detailed than cute sardonic tweets, but that doesn't mean they are deeper or better. Correct. Um, more than cute sardonic tweets, but that doesn't mean they're deeper or better. So, so, but I mean, so like specifically what i mean like what are you you're saying that there's there's no because i haven't read any of this so sure. are you saying that there's no there's nothing they're not doing anything they're not offering anything deep around i don't know uh, uh, um an analysis uh right. insight they're not right okay keep going no keep going go ahead no i mean i, I mean I, they're I don't not know. offering I mean, any I, anger they're not offering any perspective they're 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 I think, again, I don't know what this editor wanted. I don't know what this publisher wanted. And see, journalists do what editors and publishers tell them to do because they want to be in print. See, again, I know these people. That's the problem. That's why That's why when I come at well, them- Well, let me ask real quick. So like when you oh, say Cobbs, Cobbs and Rebnick's cosmopolitan yeah. approach turns radical human rights struggles into NPR weekday news pro magazine fodder, right. transforming po past geographic history into white liberal geometry. What, what, is, like, what are the, like, what are they saying? Like, can you give me an example of what they're doing that does that? Like, what are they talking about, for instance? That Well, let me, they, let me, give, let me give an example. Let me give an example yeah. that, that I think you'll like. Your, your best friend, your favorite writer, your favorite scholar. Mm. Let's talk about Skip Gates, right? Can, can you do that? Mm. Skip Gates? Okay. 
Skip Gates was practically a staff writer of the New Yorker in the 90s, right? He, he wrote a lot of pieces for New Yorker, for the New Yorker, and he actually collected his pieces called uh, 13 Ways of Looking at a Black Man, uh, which, you know, he patterned after the, the book, some sort of classic book called 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, right? Because mm -hmm. Gates is from the literary community. Gates is not a historian. He's, he's not a, a political critic. science. That's he's a right. literary critic that they chose that you're going to be the man. You're going to be the Booker T. Washington. I was told 30 years and ago by Paul Lee. I was told yeah. 30 years ago by Paul Lee that Skip Gates was going to be the Booker T. Washington Black Studies. Right? So, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. chose him. No, I'm just saying that he was chosen. No, you go ahead. Keep going. Now, now, good. now, since we're talking about Gates, you know I like admitting things to you that I've never admitted to you on, on your show, right? So let me, let me do that. I went to the root 100 dinner once. This was back when I was in Vogue, right? And I was writing for The Root. And I went to The Root 100, 100, 100 uh, uh, event, right? Now I'm in full dashiki garb, right? You know, so I'm, I'm trying to make a statement. I'm like, yeah, you know, y'all bougie people. You know, I'm coming in, you know, right? Come on, right? So I'm at the free bar because as Dr. Ball will know, I will never turn down a free bar, right? Nor should you. Thank you. And I'm getting a soda, right? And I turn around, and by the way, I've never told Dr. Ball this audience, so listen. I turn around, and this guy rolls up to me and has his hand outstretched and says, hello, brother. I'm Henry Louis Gates. And by reflex, I shake his hand. Yeah, it's hard not to do that. Yeah. And you know, Dr. Ball, all I'm thinking about is, Lord, please don't have anybody take a picture of me shaking this man's hand in a And if you have one, I want it. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm I mix sure. what I like at gmail.com. <laughs> right, right. I'm sure. Thank you. I'm sure. And I mean, and look, and look, I was, I, you know, if Jim Henry Woods Gates hadn't attacked Dr. Clark so directly, mm. I don't, I have a lot of respect for him because Henry Woods Gates' whole literary career started when he was he was about to be the top black writer at Time Magazine. And he went and did this interview with James Baldwin and with um, Josephine Baker. Right. He did this extended interview. Right. And he brought it back to Time Magazine and Time Magazine said, oh, that's this is passe. We don't care about this anymore. He's a has been the same thing, by the way, that 2020 said on that report that was just released that you can find on YouTube, this piece. This piece on tw that that they were going to do on James Baldwin on 2020 that they didn't do because they said, oh, he's passe. And by the way, I just want to say, when you go on YouTube and look that up, you're going to see why they didn't do it. Because James Baldwin was brave. He was not like these spineless black journalists today in both mm -hmm. these books. Because you know, you know what he did in that interview? He's with his family, right? He's surrounded by his family. And you see the white reporter, Sylvia Chase, there. And Sylvia Chase asked him a question about racism, you know, is it still that bad or whatever? And here's what James Baldwin said. Uh, you know, you know, James Baldwin, dear, darling, dear, darling, you know. I don't know you personally, but I know you historically. Mm. Mm. That's a nice line. Oh, oh, believe me, I've been using it for the past six months, ever since yeah, I saw that 2020 piece. That. Ever since yeah. I saw that 2020 piece, I've used that. But see, you see the bravery? Yeah. The bravery. Look, I'm I don't I'm not scared of y'all. Y'all can try to figure me out, but you don't, I don't, I don't care about you like that. I don't need your approval. I don't need your understanding. Right? Uh sounds the same elsewhere. The piece, I forget it, it's it's somewhere between 77 and 81, but again, you can find it online. Because they only just released this footage about three, four months ago. Just type in James Baldwin 2020 and you will find it, right? And, and watch it. It's a good piece. Sylvia Chase did a good job. And I like the fact that she included that piece of him saying to her that in the piece. But that's why the piece didn't run, right? Wow. We're not getting that bravery. We're not getting that bravery. 
So here you have some of the top black writers. Like I said, people I've read. So wait, these I've, are new pe- So this is this is not a new piece. This is nothing new from Gates. It's a collection of his, oh, his previous oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm mixing up. I'm going back and forth between the books. I know you got because it's two reviews. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Let me, let me stick with Gates and then New York and then I'll come back to, to the other writers. So talking about Gates, Gates does a piece on Farrakhan. And I think it's called The Charmer, I think. And by the way, this is this is the this is old, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah this is from the nineties. The again, old charmer, yeah, I read that a so, long time so, ago. Right, me yeah. too. So, so because because this 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 collection goes from the nineteen sixties all the way up to two thousand twenty, right? Now, by the way, interestingly enough, you see Minister Farrakhan respond to Gates about this article because when you go back to Wonders of the African World, there's a point where Gates is at a hotel and he runs into Minister Farrakhan. And you hear Minister Farrakhan go to him and say, I, I did not like your article. I was very disappointed in your article. And, um, uh, you know, and, and, and Gates just says, you know, well, I'll, I'll try to do better, Minister. I'll try to do better, right? But that's the article he's referring to, right? So to answer your question, you know, Gates does this whole thing, you know, grappling with Farrakhan. He's anti-Semitic. He's this, he's that, he's that. But then he says something like at the end, which I do respect. He said, um, one day America will find out how they got off easy with Minister Farrakhan. And I did respect that because we do know that the Nation of Islam, you know, it tried, it, it called itself a revolutionary organization. It, it characterized itself as a revolutionary organization. But we do know how conservative they are, and we do know that they have never, I, in, in my record, never even uh, physically accosted a white man. Forget about, you know, but attacking that suggests, But that suggests that Gates wants something more revolutionary. That's, 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 that, that's inconsistent. That's not to be praised. He's, that's inconsistent with his work, with his position, I, with his overt hostility expressed to people like Kwame Ture and, and, and other I, radicals like that. I so agree with would, all of that. I agree with all that? of that. I agree with all of that. What I mean by that is that Gates is a fiery liberal. He's not a liberal. He's a fiery liberal. And by the way, if you look at his comments during the Trump era, he said the most militant things that he's ever going to say. Right now, what does that make him? That makes him a borderline progressive. In other words, that makes him borderline Cornell West. This is why when you interview oh, Cornell, wow. this is why when you interviewed Cornell West, right? This is why Cornell West was so soft on him, because he knows. See, remember, remember, liberal progressives are just people who decided they wanted to make a good living, right? They're radicals who wanted to make a good living, so they dialed it back and they called themselves progressives, right? What are liberals? Liberals are progressives who you have not gotten drunk yet. When you get a liberal drunk and they don't care what they say and there are no white people around, right? Then they sound really angry. Gates, Gates can sound real angry. And at least he did during the Trump era. Now, I don't believe him, right? I don't believe that he, he you know, I believe he was reacting to Trump the same way the white liberals were reacting to Trump. Right. Because remember, what I also say in the review is that white liberals protested on reflex and then they ran back right to Carlos Watson. Because Carlos Watson made them feel good. Oxy made them feel good. Right. So so liberalism tends to eat on itself in terms of reinforcing the fact that we know society is corrupt, we know society is wrong, but 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 Dr. Ball, as one of our colleagues used to say, and I'm not gonna mention his name, but you know who I'm talking about, as one of our white liberal colleagues used to say at Morgan, look, I just want my grandchild to have decent health care and a decent education. They know, they know, everyone knows, everyone knows. Shoot, a lot of black folks at that institution. Exactly. That. So everyone not, knows not, yeah. that this thing is wrong. So when you're a black journalist, right, and you've been given you, now now I'm going back to to the other book. So when you're a black journalist and you've been given carte blanche to explain as as an authority, right? These black journalists and both these books are authorities, right? 
when you have the when you have the carte blanche to explain what went wrong, then you've got to explain what went wrong. And if your white liberal friends and the white liberals who give you give you jobs and foundations or whatever, if they don't like it, then they don't like it. But their courage, I'm saying this publicly, their courage was lacking. And so because their courage was lacking, they they produced something that has no utility. There are a bunch of journalism articles that were written two years ago. I mean, in terms well, of what the they're utility, saying, it, no utility for us, but the utility is is in presenting. Look, since Mr. Porter was supposed to have been on last hour, he'll he will get him back, you know, soon. But but he used to say his radio show was designed to give black people something to say at the water cooler. Right. And for those who don't remember what a water cooler is or right, what an right, actual right, office right, is or right, a job right, is, right. It's, it's, it's the point was when you go to that co that communal space and you got to hear your white colleagues say something dumb about the news. Right. Porter's point was, I need to give you something to ready, you know, so put some intellectual bullets in, in the chamber for you. Right. Uh, these folks, they're there. The, the, the utility of what it sounds like you're describing is that this is providing the water cooler commentary for the white colleague at your job. <laughs> That's the point. It's it's to give the white colleague at your job something to say, something intelligent to say or sound to say coming from black writers who they can easily see on TV whenever they turn one on. And then when they come up and when they meet you or me or someone else at the water cooler, they can think that they can have something to say. Then unfortunately for some of them, they do run into somebody like me. And I'm like, no, nah, I don't read that New York Times nonsense. Like, I don't I don't I'm not interested in your New York Times analysis or or, or limiting the analysis of the world to the New York Times. And then, and then it becomes another level of a problem. But in general, that's what I think the utility is. I think you're correct. And, I, and, and you know, with the New Yorker, it's very intellectual, right? And, you know, Cobb, for instance, And they're not writing to black people anyway. Right. Cobb is very intellectual. Now, as I've said to him personally, I, I'm not saying anything I've not said to him personally on Twitter, right? If you can make objectivity work for you, then that's great, right? So, for instance, when he did that frontline documentary on my city and police brutality, he let objectivity work for him because why? Because he let the cops themselves explain to the audience that there is no bad police cop interaction, right? The same thing that, um, Dr. Ball, I think that uh, Do Not Resist, the documentary you told me about, the same thing it did, right? So you can make objectivity work for you as long as the people are willing to tell them, tell on themselves, right? It's kind of like, you know, my... My my view now, when I teach about uh, the history of the civil rights movement, I talk about so-called nonviolence. Right? There's no nonviolence, right? Hey, they, talk about, just they, talk quickly. About, they talk about violence versus nonviolence. There's no nonviolence because because both need violence. Without no, violence, nonviolence doesn't work. We started this talking about him in his in his book of writings, The Implacable. Russell Maroon Schultz talks right. about this and I thought right. and I and I and I am happy on a very selfish level especially with the news we were talking about earlier that right. that cuz I've not done enough to write or visit these PPs so I just want to be very clear so so if if anybody watching this or listening you know wants to immediately um uh get a jump on being an improved human to me just write and and visit them more than you know than 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 I have done so i've been what dr ball what dr ball is not saying just, is the years that he went in baltimore to visit uh eddie conway he's not he's not he's i'm not saying no no, no i'm not saying i didn't do it i even right. you know i made you know i i'm not saying i've never done it you I did a lot enough i didn't i wouldn't say a lot either i just it's not i wouldn't say it's a lot it, it's 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 I, so it's just it's somewhere between never and a lot. But my point is, is that one of the few times that, that, that mm -hmm. I, I did write to Schultz was right. uh, um, uh, and there was some there was a couple there was to him and then indirectly. So I'm confused. The point I was getting at, though, I can't remember exactly of the details, but the point was uh, that to praise him on this one part. And, and I remember either he or someone who works with him was telling me that he was a little bit concerned about this particular section for some reason, right. but I thought he nailed it. And it was a section on 
what violence and nonviolence actually means. Right. And his point was nonviolence is not, uh, or, or the opposite of violence is not nonviolence. Right, right. Nonviolence, the absence of violence is not the opposite of violence. That's a, something that we have, I think, been tricked into m misunderstanding. The right. opposite of violence, and then he went back to the to the laws of physics. The opposite of violence is a countervailing violent force. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And that's one of the reasons why we not only keep losing, but we keep misunderstanding what, what the situation is. And to the point I think you're making here uh, uh, and, and about the intellectual world is that is that we're being convinced that nonviolence intellectually or otherwise, you know, non-direct action or non-combativeness uh, with the enemy physically or intellectually is somehow an absence of violence. That's not right, what's happening. Right. It is, it is, right, it right. is relinquishing the monopoly of violence to the enemy is really right. what it is. Right. So, so, I mean, anyway, I just wanted to, and no, yeah, no, that, I, I think that's very important. And by the way, while you did that, I put in the chat, the link to the uh, James Baldwin uh, 2020 piece that was not aired. Okay, uh, so, so that way people can see it. They can see what I'm talking about. Um, no, I, th I think that's no, absolutely correct. And and see, and I see, don't know you individually. I know you historically. That right. That's, 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 that's no, that's that's. that's, that's mm. I don't so, need to know you. <laughs> so <laughs> right, right. Because I already do. Because I already do. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. And I love he said that surrounded by his family, too. I love that. Mm. As in, and because the implication was, see how I don't need you. Mm. But see, mm. but see, again, that's the problem that we have because we've adopted colonialism, intellectual colonialism as desegregation and inclusion. Right. We can't think the thoughts that we would think if we're drunk. If we're sitting in the bar drunk, we have all these thoughts that we can't translate into the workspace. We can't translate into political work because then we lose out on some sort of thing that we want, whether it's material possessions or access to money or health care or you know having a nice car or whatever. And we can't see that. No, you know, you can you can speak out and have a nice car. You can speak out and have a nice place to live. I mean, I mean, you guys are proving that. I mean, I, I don't see anybody re uh, reporting in Black Power Media from a shack, right? So, but that requires a certain amount of bravery, right? That that requires a certain amount of putting your your line in the sand that says, okay, this is how I articulate reality because this is how I see reality. So it's easy for the I, black journalists when when they when they stop doing this. Like their autobiographies are very rich, by the way. These, you know, and by the way, you want to talk about hate. There was a writer, Janetta Rose Barris, who in the mid '90s wrote in in City Paper, Washington D.C. City Paper. You know what she called those books where black people talked about they did crime and all that. Then they went to the Washington Post, and that was what Nathan McCall and mm -hmm. Patrice Gaines, one of these writers. You know what? You know what she called those books? She called them neo slave narratives. Yep, I remember that. And she said, and she said, so now freedom is being at the Washington Post. Well, and you, if you're in Washington D.C., the Washington Post is everything. If you work for the Washington Post, that's like graduating from Harvard. That's like graduating from Yale. People open doors. You get great academic jobs, and you get great other jobs in D.C. because you say you work at the Washington Post. So, so we we adopt these things. And then when we get the freedom, other than autobiography, when we get the freedom to actually comment on the society, then we either choke up, which is an example of this book, or, and this is the opposite, or we tell the truth about the society and then get, and then get outed. In other words, we get, we get cast out of the intellectual realm. And that's why Jill Nelson, when she told on the Washington Post people, she then did a follow-up book. It tanked. White liberals didn't want to hear that. And so now she's one of us. She's an independent academic, you know, teaching and doing these books that people care about or not. Her anthology on police brutality is very good. But people don't call on Jill Nelson because they don't know what she's going to say. 
so just real quick, I wanted to highlight this what I highlighted here, sure, just because sure. you've already made these points. But but sure. you you said in both books the limitations are clear all around because there's no decolonizing risk taking here. Right. Uh, and to another point, we've already sort of addressed that 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 I think you raised here uh, somewhat indirectly was uh, because that that because you make the point that no one for instance because this is, goes anyway you make the point that patrice is that uh does patrice Gaines really think a young black person organizing on the street someone who's read michelle alexander's uh, michelle alexander back in college cares about the conditions of prisons in norway this of course assumes their book has an audience other than those in charge that require eternal dialogue and convincing and that's the point for me that their audience are those who are in charge, which is why they don't need to be worried about this question that you're raising here. Um, and which is why you're able to, to then, as you do at the end here, conclude that um, they've, uh, 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 I thought this was a good, not, a good line too, that they've defined blinders as shades. Uh, so they're walking around with their blinders on thinking they're cool as hell with their shades on. Um, because they're writing for an audience that pays them well and keeps them on the front pages of something. Um, and, and, you know, and I do just want to say, I can't speak for anybody else in our collective, but um, uh, speaking for myself, you know, materially. Yeah. I mean, uh, there are benefits to, as I say, marrying up. You know, right. There's, right. There's clearly that. Right. Um, and there are contradictions there as well. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. But 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 I but I do want to point out that that that, you know, to your point, some courage is is needed or some principle is needed because. Um, uh, so I wouldn't say that I'm, you know, suffering materially, certainly not like, you know, relative to the academic world I am. And relative to the right, academic absolutely. world, there has absolutely. been and continues to be a great degree of sacrifice and punishment absolutely. That, that goes oh, on. Absolutely. So, so now, not as much as some of my other colleagues who we've been right. highlighting here lately, uh, who, right. whose lawsuits speak for themselves. But, but, uh, but yeah, so I mean, but but even no, we, within, we lost a lot. Let's just tell the truth. We lost a lot. And, and, and I don't want to put too much of your business out there. Right. But, you know, I, I think I think. I would have encouraged you to make some other choices. That's in terms true. Of your response, that's but, true. But you got punished as well. Like this was, this is, this is, you know. So like, like there again, it may be in fact true that right. that I'll speak for myself. I'm not right. broadcasting from the street, right, right, and, right. And I have, I have, right. you know, food to eat and health care. Right. So you know, right. but uh, 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 and all of that, but. Uh, um, Anyway, let me just say that. Let me we we, that. we both got punished for that Malcolm X book, and we're both proud of that punishment. Mm -hmm. And right now, I'm in an apartment. Not just that. I'm not speaking but, for, right, speaking right, for, right, I, for right. you in particular. I think not right. just that, right. but that did not help our career. Right. No, it did not. And right now, you know, I, I live in what in Newark, New Jersey is called luxury housing, right? Mm -hmm. And because Newark, New Jersey is as depressed as it is, everywhere else in the world, it would just be called housing, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and yeah, I mean, I live, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I live hand to mouth. And, and, but it's interesting though, to, to prove this point. I mean, one of the, the contract jobs I got now was because I was brave because I, I went and told a very prominent person that their book was not good. And I had to explain why. And, and as a result of that, I now work for that person. Wow. I mean, so so there's and 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 I and I have this apartment partly because of that, right? And so I just want to say that I don't know how other black journalists view that Baldwin statement, right? That Baldwin bravery behind that statement. I know that when I see it, I'm inspired to continue to be honest, to continue to be blunt. And yeah, I I should have made some very compromising uh um choices that i did not make that is very true and every day i debate it but when i see like i said but when i see real bravery when i see the bravery of a mumia abu jamal who by the way as a biographer i mean i have my own criticism of him as you you know as this audience knows right but when i see his bravery that he is willing to write what he thinks regardless of the consequences to him 
when I see the bravery of a Baldwin, when I see the bravery of all the people that we admire who, who stood up directly against this structure, I am inspired to continue to be reckless and I'm inspired to continue to make bad choices because I want this record to show that I was not afraid to say certain things. And thanks to you, I have that record. So again, I, I want to thank you because we're actually at the close of the hour. Yeah, we are. You did that pretty well too. That was, that was pretty good. Thank you. Um, there is, I, I, can't, I don't know where I put it. There is a, a, a woman whose name escapes me and she writes, she currently runs, I was only just recently introduced to her work uh, and she does not want to do interviews, uh, mm -hmm. which kind of sucks, but right. Right. Uh, she runs the, or at least, well, she, she runs the um, uh, McLuhan uh, Media Center at the University of Toronto. Toronto, something like that. She's in Canada and she does right, something. Right. She, she runs the McLuhan Center up there. Right. And she, you know, a, a mutual friend who knows that I, I like McLuhan's work put us in touch. And she had written something that you just reminded me of about it's a, it's a, it's a sort of a, a feminist approach to McLuhan's work where she was talking about how something to the effect we are encouraged to be reduced to tools in service of this machine right and she was saying we need to be learn we need to become broken tools so she was talking about the like being a broken tool and 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 i kind of like that approach like and again there are there are prices to yeah. that while, while you literally just said that dr ball i checked my email and i've just been turned down for a major fellowship <laughs> oh, well. that, and they talked about oh 250 people applied for around the world and i'm like yeah i, I understand i understand there there are oh there we are, should do it you know what we should do a show on that oh we, so we should read we should oh, go we back so and should. get all of our rejection letters oh, i just so got should. another one myself oh we so should <clears throat> oh we so should. but again but again yeah go <laughs> what what are we writing this for i told you I want to I want to be Mr. Rogers. I want to say every book is great. This is wonderful. The writer did such a great job. I want to do that, right? I mean, you know, but again, I then look at people's choices. And you know, we're talking about Russell Maroon Schultz. We're talking about a man who believed in freedom so much. He didn't talk about breaking out of the joint. He broke out the joint Repeatedly. twice. Yeah. Twice, right? And and this is his punishment, right? This you're only going to breathe, you know, 25 times outside of this jail cell. So, you know, if we say we believe in these people that that have sacrificed, then we have to then decide, okay, what is worth sacrificing and what is not worth sacrificing. And I think that that is a dilemma uh, that we have. I just know that that I don't want to attack my fellow family members. I don't wanna attack members of my AME church. I don't wanna do that. But here's the problem, if I don't do that, if I don't do these kind of rough commentaries, right? Who's gonna do them? Because the people who are gonna read them are gonna be invested in the same structures that produce the products that are upsetting. And for so me, I these are the people who no one actually reads uh, and at this point, myself included, I'm not reading this stuff. Sure. Uh, but 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 these people, because they have written it and have written it to to their audience, are right. rewarded by that audience by being put in front of right. those who would become our audience. Right. And then we they become a barrier to our right. Own work. So my students right. hear from all of these people, not because they read their work, but because of their reward is that Jelani Cobb, right, was Gates they're put on TV. Right. People were packed in the other day to see Cornell West. Right. At Morgan State, not because they've read a word he's put in print. Right. But because he has been rewarded for a certain level of adherence to the rules. Right. And put where he's been put in the matrix and everywhere else. Right. And he comes around and he did us a solid. He did I'm awesome. He, he did me a solid, but he did. but but that's why he's there. So then right. when, we, if, when we do read their work or when we produce our own, 
their presence and their analysis of the world is what we have to contend with first. Because the first thing that my students are referring to, consciously or not, is something Jelani Cobb said on MSNBC. Right. Or something that right. so said on some popular YouTube channel. Right. And 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 then I'm like, well, damn. I mean, right. but I actually read their work. Did you read right. it? Nah, right. Nah, no. Nah. But he's no. on TV and he's taught, he said we're supposed to vote for Biden. Right. You can't be right. Right. Well, damn. I mean, anyway, and, so and, and I'm Duval, glad you Duval, do what you do and, and, offer, and give me something to say, by the way, just real quick, you ahead, give me ahead. something to say at that mm -hmm. virtual sure. water cooler. Sure. Sorry, go well, ahead. Well, well, let me just say, first of all, let me just say, there's Raymond Wimbush, and then there's Jared Ball, <laughs> and then there's everybody else at Morgan State University, right? That I didn't say that. Cornell West said that. And by the way, I say that every day. When I want to laugh, I say that every day. Now let me funny. say now let me say the contradictions to that. If you say the exact oh by the way, are we okay with time? Are we are we are we, are we all right? Yeah, we're good. I, I do have to go, but go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Well, then, well then let me just do a little, little wrap up. When you say the same things that Cornell West says yeah. in front of people, they give you the stink eye. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's like, okay, so like so like these statements only matter if Angela Davis or if Cornell West says yeah. them. So we deal with yeah. that contradiction as well. No. I don't know what other people learn from Baldwin, but I read, I read the whole price of the ticket, that big white book that no one reads, right? Um it's a great book, man. It's a fantastic book. And and Baldwin's thing is. Bearing witness does not mean being popular. Bearing witness means bearing witness. And if there are consequences of bearing witness, you're supposed to be so in love with the spirituality behind that act that you are willing to take the hits that come from that. I don't want to be critical, but I don't know anybody else who's willing to take the risks of offending people that I take. And and because there's no village voice, right? Because there used to be a whole newspaper of people that did what I did and did it in a much better way than I did it called the village voice, right? Well, that doesn't exist. All of those writers are somewhere else now. So who's going to do a critical review of these two books if I don't do it? No one's going to touch it. Why? Well, they don't get paid for it. Right. Well, they, they'll they just offend people. Right. Well, who wants to alienate people? Who knows where my next job is going to come from? These people might know the white people that will give me my next job. So see, oh, all these do. things. And they do. And they do. So all these things come up that block people from saying what they would say if they were drunk. And so I think this role that I have, and I'm going to be honest about this, it's painful. It's hard to do. I hesitate for a long time before I text you and let you know <laughs> that there's something in your drafts. Because I know that whatever's in that in those drafts, you are going to look at and go, oh, that is gonna go out of iMix, right? I I don't I don't like that I put myself at risk. I don't like it. And I'm not a martyr. I'm far from being a martyr, right? You can't be a martyr and you walking around with tails of suspense, Iron Man, Captain America shirt on, right? Um, so I'm far Why from not? a martyr. And 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 I'm you know, and I'm not an activist, I'm not a I'm not a radical, I'm not a revolutionary, but but here's what I believe. I believe in the right for a black person to look a white person in the eyes and say, I don't know you personally, but I know you historically. And if we don't have that bravery now, if we don't have the bravery of, an, of a Naomi Osaka, mm. who was clear on, on the analysis, right? She was clear on it. She called it genocide. What was going on with us was genocide. The people that Democracy Now! did not cover this weekend, right? They call it, the black people there call it genocide. If we're not clear on the analysis and we're worried about offending somebody, then we might as well go down with the Henrietta Marie and just put the chains on. Mm. All right, everybody. You know what? And to be fair, I don't know. I don't know. 
everything that has happened on this platform, but I don't think we've covered enough of the spirit of Mandela either. Uh, I tried to get Jaleel on, but anyway, so. Uh, they have plenty so of footage. They to, have plenty of footage. To you be can fair, we, 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 need to, we need to probably do some more there too, but um, uh, oh, wait, uh, uh, be careful, Big Teal. Uh, <laughs> right, cause, right, Because right. Dr. Burroughs right. has read mine, and right. you got to be careful with that. <laughs> right, cause, right, cause, right. Because I didn't post his review on iMix, but his his reviews of even his his closest comrades uh, can be brutal. So you got to be careful what you risk. I, I agree. I agree. You know. So anyway, look, good people. <laughs> uh, I I do have to run. I really appreciate. A shout out to Mr. Porter. We'll have to do you know try again, of course, to have him on, and and he's of course welcome anytime. Uh, as is his daughter, who was set to join us this morning. Uh, so we'll, we'll reconvene, uh, but Dr. Burroughs, thank you very much for joining us. All those in the chat, thank you. And those who will see this later. I mix what I like. Whoops. I didn't mean to do that because what I meant to do was to say that if I didn't get to it, you know, we do come back and check it later. So as my man, Pierre over at comedy hype says, put it in the comments. We'll catch you here next time at I Mix What I Like Live. Like Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace because we know you're willing to fight for it. So peace, everybody. Thanks again. Remix Morning Show tomorrow. Peace, everybody. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.